Harm reduction supplies, so we have needles. A felon with a decade behind bars after a drug possession charge at age 16, Nicole Alexander now helps others and says it's time to rethink the war on drugs. A simple possession charge is never simple when you have lifelong consequences behind that. The state Supreme Court agrees. It declared our state's law criminalizing drug possession unconstitutional, which invalidates decades of convictions. Brown and black families are disproportionately impacted. Lawmakers are rushing to come up with new drug laws before the session ends this week. We must act for the health and safety of our kids. How will legislators balance community demands for both criminal penalties and addiction treatment? We know that incarcerating people destabilizes their life. Our panel weighs in. What is best for public safety and what is best yeah. for the individuals to help them succeed? So when's your next appointment? When's your second vaccine? Dealing with drug possession laws, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Lawmakers in Olympia are scrambling to deal with a bombshell from the state Supreme Court. The Blake decision in February struck down Washington's drug possession law, which some see as a welcome push towards the use of more treatment rather than criminal punishment in drug cases. But the court's ruling also invalidates decades of past felony drug convictions and puts current law enforcement officers in a challenging position as the legislature tries to craft a solution. We're just a few days away from the end of the session at the Capitol, in the middle of a battle over drug policy that doesn't show signs of stopping anytime soon. Okay, you want cookies? Nicole Alexander deals with hundreds of people in need every day as an outreach care coordinator for King County's Just Care program. Okay, so this is all wound care. She provides medical supplies, food, and plenty of understanding to people with drug addictions. Do you need harm reduction stuff? No. What's up? Needles, pipes. Nicole is a former user herself with 25 years in the criminal justice system. I try every day to break my generational incarceration, my generational crime, my generational addiction so that my children don't go there. She's nearly six years clean and sober and has a college degree. But her criminal past, which began with a drug possession charge at age 16, has haunted her. I still can't find an appropriate place for myself and my children to live. That's a big reason why she saw the state Supreme Court's Blake decision in February, which struck down a portion of Washington's drug possession law as unconstitutional as a sign of hope. Yeah, there you go. We're really, really at a point where we have to stop. We have to really care for our people. Providing that care via treatment rather than criminal penalty is the goal for senators like Democrat Manka Dingra. But the race is on. The timing of this uh, decision, of course, was very unexpected. With simple drug possession now essentially decriminalized, legislators in Olympia have been forced to deal with a void in our state law with just days left in the session. This is not a partisan issue. Republican Senator Ann Rivers says there's consensus to get something done and to push for treatment first in drug possession cases, which disproportionately involve people of color. The war on drugs has particularly hurt black, brown, and indigenous communities. But lawmakers have struggled with ideas like allowing people over 21 to legally possess certain amounts of drugs for personal use, two grams of cocaine or one gram of heroin, for example. We simply cannot support a bill that authorizes the possession of drugs. And that's just one hurdle. Everybody is working really hard. Consider that now, judges will have to resentence decades worth of drug possession cases at a time when our courts are already reeling from COVID delays. Our justice system is so backed up right now. Rivers calls the Blake decision the work of an activist Supreme Court, and she's worried cities will push back with their own legal solutions. If we do not act at the state level, what you're going to see is a patchwork, and uh, I don't think that that serves anyone well. But that's exactly what's happened in Marysville. We're now prosecuting this uh, as a gross misdemeanor in our municipal court. John Nearing, the mayor of Marysville, says he wanted a city drug possession law rather than waiting on the state for months 
and simply letting drug crimes in his area continue. So A, you're, you're damaging all the law-abiding citizens in your community and the businesses, and B, you're not, having, you're not helping the person that's addicted. Nearing, who joins a handful of other mayors who've helped pass city-level drug possession laws, says treatment, not jail time, should always be the first option in drug cases. But, he says, when people can't or won't accept treatment, that's what the justice system is for. There has to be accountability here. We're going to continue to work with the House. Lawmakers are proposing compromises, calling drug possession a gross misdemeanor, not a felony, and requiring two attempts at treatment programs before jail time could be considered. I am feeling cautiously optimistic. Senator Dingra hopes to find consensus, but warns against any approach that has too much involvement from law enforcement. Because that's what the war on drugs started us down that path, thinking that you can find your way or criminalize your way out of addiction, and you simply can't. <laughs> Like the emergency calls Nicole sees nearly every day, there's an urgency for the state to act in the wake of the Blake decision. You're okay. And she says the state needs to provide some realistic alternatives for drug addicts that are long overdue. What we should be arguing over is why we haven't done this earlier. Thank you, guys. And joining us to discuss this topic further, we have with us Malika Lamont. She is the project manager for the Washington State Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Expansion Team for the Public Defender Association. And also with us, Steve Strawn. He is executive director of the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Thanks to both of you for being here. And I want to talk about this and give some people some background. We are recording this show as lawmakers in Olympia are still working on legislation to respond to the state Supreme Court's Blake decision on drug possession. Quick recap here. Our law on simple drug possession had said, even if you did not know you were in possession of a controlled substance without a prescription, that was illegal. The court said that was unconstitutional. And that's basically forced the legislature to come up with a new drug possession law. Malika, you first. In general terms, what are you hoping to see? What sort of drug policy should be coming out of the state session in your mind? Um, I'm hoping that we will get a policy that recognizes that um, our system of prohibition is not has not been effective with connecting people that have behavioral health issues um, with the treatment services that they need and um, that we need to build out systems of care in our communities and that are driven by the communities and that we need to um, create alternative responses um, rather than um, police to, you know, pe to people with behavioral, they're experiencing behavioral health issues. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a broader imagination um, about what those treatment systems can look like so that they can be responsive to the needs that communities are um, experiencing. Got it. Thanks very much. Steve, same question to you. This is really a law enforcement agency question around the state, around the country. People looking at this right now, our legislature, uh, our legislature, I should say, trying to find a solution to Blake with just days left in the session as we're recording this. What are you hoping Olympia comes up with? Um, one of the things I think that it's important for folks to hear is, is Malik and I are actually have many of the same goals. And I think to build a more robust and more responsive treatment and support system is something that, you know, as a 35 year law enforcement officer, it's incredibly needed. Uh, one of our frustrations has always been that unavailability or difficulty of accessing what persons with behavioral health issues and addictions need. And I think you, again, you can ask any law enforcement officer, the criminal justice system is not the best place to deal with these issues. It is sometimes the only place that ends up uh, dealing with some of the issues that are symptomatic of it. And so I think, I think I can say this very clearly. We have the exact same goals. It's a matter of how to get there, particularly at this time where we have to make a lot of very intense and really substantive decisions in a short amount of time yeah. legislatively. And, and I would say that I think our legislators are listening to the to the, all stakeholders. We are yeah. only one. Yeah. Uh, but the fact is we want the same thing, and that is to get people healthy and off the streets in a way that's good for public safety. Got it. Well, let me put a fine point on it with you here, Steve, because it seems like lawmakers have really, really been talking about this one point, this idea that the involvement of some sort of criminal penalty for drug possession, mm -hmm. it's really emerged as a key issue here. Do you think there should be some level of criminal penalties involved here to compel people to get into treatment? What do you think about that? And that's sort of the fundamental question. And, and you know, please, again, hear loud and clear. I don't think that criminal penalties should be the centerpiece of dealing with addiction at all. However, I think incentives for treatment may be appropriate for some. And I think to continue to have that as an available tool 
is something that we should be deliberate about in terms of whether we're going to change that or not. But again, it should not be the centerpiece of, of these issues that we're talking about. So again, I think there's a lot of common ground. It's a matter of what that looks like. Yeah, and, and Malika, the Senate certainly was talking about this a lot. We saw a lot of division over this issue. Senator Monka Dingra, the original sponsor, actually voted against her own bill as it left the Senate recently here. So now we're talking about the engrossed version of Senate Bill 5476, would still call drug possession a crime, but a misdemeanor, not a felony, and by the year 2023, call it a civil infraction. So prosecutors would also, on top of that, be required to divert first and second time offenders into treatment that encourage diversions for future violations. Is this version that I'm talking about here a good compromise, or how do you see it? It is not the ultimate place that I would like to have us land, but I think that it is going to be close to where we end up at the end of this particular session. I don't think that it was realistic for us to think that we were going to solve 100 years of prohibition in one legislative session. Um, and so I think that uh, it is going to be where we land, but it is not the goal. Um, criminal penalties um, make it harder for people to uh, get a place to live. They make it harder for people to um, get work. They make it harder for people to stay with their families, keep their children. Um, so I would, I think that we shouldn't have criminal penalties. Um, do I think a misdemeanor and a civil infraction are better than a felony? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, the, we will see that localities are going to probably go a little yeah. wild with it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it's going to create, um, more complications for individuals. Um, yeah. And also that for some of our most vulnerable people in our communities, um, what will end up happening is those civil infractions will turn into um, a criminal issue because yeah. they will not have the capability to respond to them. Yeah. And um, and misdemeanors, you know, that those result in jail time. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know that incarcerating people destabilizes their life, you know, yeah. even further. And it disconnects them from their ability to have their health insurance so that they can engage in treatment. Mm -hmm. It, um, you know, causes family separations um, you know, and, and it just makes it and, and it can be traumatizing. You know, when, yeah. when you put a lot of people that have been harmed to get and have harmed other people together, um, that doesn't always end up well. I'm going to put a pin on that idea of what the localities are going to do about this for a minute, because, Steve, I wanted to take up another issue here that has been talked about in the state this session. Voters in Oregon actually overwhelmingly passed a measure last fall that set up legal personal use limits, decriminalized hard drugs here. Uh, advocates point to the country of Portugal, which has legalized all drugs, has lower drug use rates, fewer drug overdose deaths. Uh, in our state, it looks like this personal use piece is not going to be on the table here. The House trying to do this to get the Senate to agree to a solution here on the Blake decision here. But what's your position on legalizing personal use limits for drugs like cocaine and heroin? Well, I think that's part of the issue is that the environment is changing. Expectations are changing. Certainly what we expect from the criminal justice system and how it impacts communities is obviously changing and in many ways for the good. These are conversations we should have. Uh, to Malika's point, and I, I get it, not just as a law enforcement officer in my family, my extended family, uh, you know, we have family members who have those issues where criminal justice involvement puts folks into a cycle that makes it worse, not better. How do we break that cycle while still balancing that with, with public safety and how that affects the community? That's where we are. And I would just point to, um, as that, that environment changes, as the way we approach this changes, as we find better ways to get people off, you know, again, out of that addiction and to get healthy. Um, and again, criminalization is not the center of it. It's, I think yeah. it's, it might need to be part of it, but the support and the treatment and the availability of it is I think something that we have really general agreement on. And if, yeah. as we focus on that, and it's, instead of talking about it, doing it, yeah. Uh, I think law enforcement is, is looking forward to having the availability to get people yeah. into what they need. Yeah. And again, I just want to maintain that, that element of incentivizing treatment for those who need it. Once that system is built, let's have this conversation about yeah. whether it should continue to be a criminal offense or not. Steve, I want to make sure that I'm clear, though. Do you support this idea of having limits on controlled substances, that personal use limit? What do you think? Um, I think uh, limits, you know, as I said, if, let out. To answer that question, I would take you back to House Bill 1499, Representative mm -hmm. Davis's bill, um, which basically said we're going to to change how we approach criminalization of, of personal possession, yes, of any controlled substance, and link it with 
a much more robust commitment to treatment. Okay. We didn't say that we hate that idea. What we said was make sure you make the commitment first before we have the conversation about personal limits. Okay. Because again, I think we all acknowledge that that is changing and our approach needs to change. It just needs okay. to be balanced as we move forward. Malika, just asking you here, do you think that personal use limits piece, does that have a future here at the state legislature? Your thoughts about that? Um, so we, I was a part of creating House Bill 1499, Pathways to Recovery. And we were hoping that in what the hangup was, part of the reason why it died was because, um, including law enforcement, came out against the decriminalization piece. Um, and so we would like, everybody was on board, though, for building out the treatment systems in our state. And um, we need to be able to fund those, though, in a meaningful way in order yeah. to b build a robust response system yeah. um, that will be available in real time to people when they are ready to um, engage in behavior change, you know, yeah. and to, if they want, if getting help is the thing that they need. Right. Um, okay. And, you know, some people, you know, recovery is different for everybody and yes. everybody's path to recovery is different. Right. Um, but we need to have um, a plethora of options available to folks that are relevant to them, that are based yeah. in their communities, and that they don't have to travel long distances for. So that was right. what we had, you know, we had built out this robust system in 1499. Mm -hmm. And when it died, the Blake decision literally happened, like, I think two weeks later, wasn't it, mm -hmm. Steve? Anyway, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and to Steve's point, you know, LEAD has demonstrated that when we do something different, and communities are, be able, are able to build out and design mm -hmm. um, their LEAD programs, um, I've actually been working with Steve and Waspik um, on their arrest and jail alternative programs across mm -hmm. the state. And then we've been working with the healthcare authority on, um, you know, working to implement lead programs across yeah. the state. Mm -hmm. And after House Bill, I mean, excuse me, after the Blake decision occurred, I started calling all the sites that I have been providing right. technical assistance for. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them that is, I, I'm in Thurston County. And so in Mason County, I reached out to the outreach workers because I'm a former outreach worker. So yeah. I was like, you need to make sure you got Narcan on board because if folks mm -hmm. get out, you know, their their tolerance will be lower and we sure. need to make sure that they're not overdosing. We need to make sure people have the care that they need, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and because in jail, they're oftentimes not getting their substance use disorder needs met. They're just- right not using drugs, which is yeah. not the same thing as getting treatment. Okay. Um, and so, um, but I got a call back 15 minutes later and they were like, we don't have anybody on simple possession because mm. everybody has been diverted to lead and they're all engaging right. in, um, you know, the programming. And, then, and so I think that if we can build infrastructure throughout our state, um, you know, while we are simultaneously building out the systems of care, okay, um, you know, then we can start creating that meaningful response. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that that will be a meaningful part of what happens in the legislature. I mean, we have until Sunday, we'll see. I mean, okay. you know, um, and I think that that is a place, you know, that Steve and I definitely agree. I mean, okay. we've worked together to the point where it's worked <laughs> across yeah. the whole entire state. Right. So from no, Walla Walla to assisted Shelton. assisted diversion. Yes, no, it's, <laughs> it's a big deal. And, and Malika, I, I just wanna make sure that I follow up on another, another piece with you here, another, infrastructure issue, if you will. What happens to all the past drug possession cases in our state? There's going to be this massive resentencing process, as I understand it. It's not clear yet how much that'll cost, how long that's going to take. But I wanted to throw out a for instance here that I thought was interesting. Officers charge a suspected drug dealer with intent to deliver controlled substances. But in court, that dealer pleads guilty to a lesser charge, drug possession. With Blake, though, that possession charge is overturned and the suspected dealer potentially walks out of court. Your concerns about cases like that and what I think could be a real legal mess ahead of us here. Well, um, that's also um, so I'm part of the Care First Coalition as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we were we helped build the Pathways to Recovery. And um, I think that oftentimes people that are engaged in low level dealing, um, they have their own you know, substance use issues themselves. Yeah. And if they can get engaged in meaningful treatment, and we also had put forth a framework that would um, make it so that there was a commitment across the state that people, mm -hmm. that individual prosecutors were not going to pursue those higher charges if yeah. the um, lower ones got dismissed. Okay. And we also had suggested a framework around, so for example, the, you know, summer of freedom where we had mm -hmm. like mass um, evacuations of people's mm -hmm. sentences so yeah. that we could keep the price down yeah. Um, and and also enlist, you know, people from across the state that want to help. I mean, for example, my mom's an attorney. She, I had mentioned mm -hmm. it to her. She was like, I'm in. Anyway, yeah. you know, so it's like we can get people, you know, to engage okay. in this process. And it would cost 
exponentially less than having people have to return back to the jurisdiction where they got their original charge, yeah. potentially right. have to be in jail for a while. And then, you know, and then all these other things that we could focus right. on actually reinvesting in communities and individuals, yeah. getting them their LFOs back. I mean, like if we're yeah. really talking about restoration of individuals and communities, we have an opportunity yeah. to do some really meaningful stuff. I think so too. And that legal financial obligations you talk about, the LFOs, that's going to be a key part of this. But Steve, I wanted to make sure I got you weighing in here. Your thoughts on the need to resentence all these cases, what that's going to be like, or officers going to have to be called in to testify. Where do you see this going? Well, certainly prosecutors across the state are, are dealing with those very issues in terms of the logistics, the costs, uh, dismissal of certain charges, return, you know, returning fines from potentially years ago, and whatever impacts uh, were, were, were felt by those individuals involved. Um, I've heard numbers around $100 million in terms of the cost of that. So it's, it's very, very substantial. I think the legislature is trying to pay attention to that. But I, you know, I agree with Malik. I agree with a lot of what Malika has said. And again, as she mentioned, we work together. We we strongly support these diversion programs mm -hmm. uh, that Malika works with, and we're the folks that administer that to the agencies yeah. across the state, who, by the way, love the programs and want to become mm -hmm. more involved. And we yeah. want more of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to your question, um, the in terms of resensing and restoration. Um, again, I, I think there's real common ground here in terms of okay. there's a logistics piece to it, but it's also what is best for public safety and what is best yeah. for the individuals to help them succeed. Okay. And as we have made clear now for years, uh, you know, it isn't all about enforcement. It's about reducing recidiv recidivism, helping yeah. people succeed when they are coming out of the criminal justice mm -hmm. system, when we are fully on board uh, yeah. for systems that build that. Steve, let me stick with you here. We've got cities like Marysville, Wenatchee, Lakewood, all passing their own drug possession ordinances right now. Grant Lewis County as well. Other jurisdictions apparently working on this too. What are your concerns about that patchwork of legal guidelines we have right now? I know we've heard from the Seattle PD here in the city that officers have stopped confiscating drugs altogether based solely on possession. As we transition drug possession from a felony to a misdemeanor, I wanted to touch on this because Malika brought this up earlier. I think this might create kind of a burden for cities and counties who would have to take on these cases. Yeah, and to your question about the patchwork, I mean, there's an yeah. element that says, well, local control is a good thing, but another element that says that can be maybe a, 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 a difficult expectation for individuals yeah. that one town is different than the next. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Marysville, and it's one of the cities that has, has moved forward to that. The chief there, Eric Scarpian, um, mm -hmm. uses this phrase, and I love it, it's lead with compassion incentivize treatment and help support the tools to address those who continue to refuse services. That is in effect why they did what they did and their approach. But again, it's lead with compassion and try to keep people out of the system whenever yeah. possible. And the reason I mention this is that the chief, as soon as the Blake decision came out, he said the next day he was riding with one of his sergeants, came upon a woman who was using a controlled substance uh, near a railroad track and they offered her services, offered to try to get her into treatment. That's what they do. And her answer was, it's legal now. I'm not interested. I'm not going anywhere. He pointed to that as part of our challenge of how do we address that? And again, I think it's greater than just that incident, but that's that's yeah. one specific example yeah. where I think that's one of the reasons that Murray's bill has moved in that direction. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be better for us to have a statewide policy, yeah. but um, if the legislature chooses to, to not do anything to change the Blake decision, I think we'll probably see more of that. Of course. And Malik, I just wanted you to respond to that story. I'm sure you've heard that one before. And I think it gets to this point that officers might tell you if they don't have a clear legal authority to contact people for possession, then we lose a connection of some sort there. And this pathway that could potentially get people into help they need with addiction is not happening. How do you respond to that? Well, as a person who ran a syringe exchange for 13 years, and when I say ran, did the direct service, anyway, and have worked with people that have substance use issues um, or issues with substance use my whole career, um, I think that there's a lot of things. One, she was on the railroad tracks. She didn't have a place to live. Yeah. Um, you know, she was in an unsafe situation. And I think that there's a lot of things that could have occurred that um, could have made her more safe. I think mm -hmm. that continuing to make law enforcement, the response to people that are engaged or that have behavioral health issues is not safe. Um, I think that um, it has the potential to escalate and that oftentimes law enforcement are not trained to be able to work with people that have profound behavioral health issues that are longstanding, that are oftentimes grounded in generational trauma. And um, we seem to have had this recognition and reckoning with that, with the, you know, 
myriad of bills that have been passed around police reform in Washington state this session. Yeah, right. But I am troubled by the complete disconnect with the recognition that if that we're talking about the same people oftentimes. Mm. And right. so if we have recognized that we need to change our systems of policing, and then why are we still trying to apply this blunted tool, mm. you know, that the, this enforcement tool okay. to something that requires potentially that requires a lot more precision. Right. You know? right. And it's not and I'm not saying that to insult individual officers or anything like that. Sure. Like I work with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that we we have a system yeah. that is designed to do one thing that has become the response system right. inappropriately. And yeah. I mean, we have to look back at the drug war. It's like, do yeah. we want to continue to, you know, reinforce these really dysfunctional tropes that yeah. are not helping anybody? Yeah. I mean, you know, officials in the Nixon administration admitted that the reason why the drug war was started was yeah. because to discredit the black power movement and to discredit the anti-war movement. Okay. So when are we going to be done with that? And right. when are it we going to start building relevant responses and funding them? Thank you, Malika. Those are all important points. We need to wrap up the show. And if you could, the 32nd version here. I know every lawmaker I've talked to said this session is not the end of it. Of course, there's an advisory committee now forming set to make recommendations by December of this year. Some final thoughts here, maybe words of advice for legislators. I can give you 30 seconds. I, I think that we need to have an interdisciplinary group of people working together um, in order to come up with real solutions that are based in reality mm -hmm. from the people living that reality I'm also the director of Vocal Washington, Voices yep. of Community Activists and Leaders, and we need to bring people with lived and living experience to the table so that we yep. can create real responses that are going to be relevant to the conditions that they're experiencing. We yep. also need to talk with law enforcement so that we mm -hmm. can understand their job and the way that they're doing things. And we need to yep. bring treatment providers to the table and we need to bring impacted community members and families. And we need right. to look at the golden thread that goes through all of our systems okay. and start addressing it in order to create meaningful responses. Okay. to what communities are experiencing. Thanks, 30 seconds, Steve, final thoughts here. Certainly, Treme a tremendous amount of common ground and an acknowledgement that, um, and again, as Malika mentioned, we work together on a lot of these diversion programs. These are things that we are very interested in doing and doing it better and not viewing everything as let's start from enforcement or let's start from that kind of contact. But it comes back to what Malika mentioned, which is that heavy lifting of we need the systems to do that, that have the right stakeholders there to talk about what's going to be needed. And, and frankly, not just us. And so uh, to build the right systems and to provide those off ramps to get people out of the criminal justice system in the first place, because that has become sort of our context. Um, law enforcement wants to do what the community needs us to do to keep people safe, period, to get people healthy, period. This is an important conversation to have and to continue to have. Indeed it is. Thank you both for your input here. And we will be right back. What are people on social media saying about this issue? One person writes, the Washington legislature must not pass any bills to recriminalize drug possession. Another writes, drug possession is a crime. Enforce it. You'll soon see usage come down. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, a new coalition called Compassion Seattle is backing a ballot measure to address the city's homelessness crisis. If it passes, city leaders would be required to keep our parks and sidewalks free of encampments and to create 2,000 new housing units. But some advocates for homeless people are voicing concerns. We'll bring you the latest next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.